This is Defenders TV podcast episode 102, where we are looking at Iron Fist season one, episode 13, Dragon Plays with Fire. Welcome back, fellow Defenders, to this episode of Defenders TV Podcast 102, where we are looking at the dragon that plays with fire, the final episode, episode 13 of the first season of Iron Fist. I am one of your hosts, John. I am your other host, Chris. And I'm your final co-host, Derek. Welcome back. Wee! Yeah, welcome We're there, back, guys. Everyone. We're at the end. Yeah, we are. 13 episodes of Iron Fist, and we've gone through every single one of them. Great fun. Finally, yeah, absolutely. It's flown by. Any particular thoughts that jump out at you immediately after finishing episode 13? We never got to see a dragon. We saw no. its eyes. <laughs> we saw its eyes. They stole that from me. I'm positive. <laughs> I, I've been saying that for what? Like 12 episodes now? It was like, oh, you needed some red eye. Okay, they did that. Nice. <laughs> nice. Were you watching ahead again, Chris? I must have been, I swear. No, you weren't. I know you weren't. <laughs> yeah. Personally, it was strong closing. Right. That's That was the first thing <laughs> I thought as I came out of this. It was, that was a strong closing. Like, it, it could have faltered. I didn't know where they were going to go with episode 13, mm-hmm. as I said in the last episode. Um, I didn't know what was happening, but they did this. They did it well. It was a strong close. It was not everything was tied up in a nice bow that I wanted, mm-hmm. but I think we'll probably get to that more later on. But yeah, it was a strong closing. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think um, you know. Also, it, it, it links to one of our questions posed by one of our listeners. Um, but I think the the closing. Um, uh, and the direction here uh, from about episode 10 was was really, really good. I, I agree, Chris. Pretty solid and, and strong, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We didn't get too many wrap-ups. I do think uh, it was a shame not to hear about Big Al um, <laughs> from episode 1. But I, I do kind of now question what on earth was Big Al. Um, I presume it's one of those frozen chicken breasts that you get in, uh, in the supermarket. Yeah, Big Al's. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, as as our listeners probably know, we uh, we don't watch ahead when we're watching our episodes. We watch all thirteen episodes one at a time and podcast about them, as you should know by now. Uh, so you've probably been hearing our crazy theories about what we thought was going to happen at the end of the series. Some things panned out, a lot more things didn't, <laughs> as usual. Uh, but yeah, I think I agree with you guys. Yeah, it's a pretty good, pretty strong closing. But I think it's time to get into our spoiler-filled discussion uh, on the final episode of Iron Fist. But a couple of things, I suppose, that we need to talk about for what's happening after uh, Iron Fist. Absolutely. Um, so we will be kicking off with our Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 review. Mm. It's out here in Ireland on the 28th of April. So we will get a podcast release probably within a, a week or two of of that date. So mm-hmm. it should coincide with its release date in the US of A, which is about a week after, I think. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we're going to move on to our Summer of Spidey. The reference I completely missed on our 100th episode of what to look forward to, of course, with Spider-Man Homecoming uh, being released on the 7th of July worldwide. Um, So we will be covering all the um, films that lead up to that with previous Spider-Man uh, in the form of Tobey Maguire and, of course, uh, Andrew Garfield as well. Mm-hmm. Um, all those lovely um, repeats there. Um, we will, of course, then be moving from Summer of Spidey into Defenders, which comes out on the 18th of August. And, of course, last but not least, just to throw it out there, there will be Thor Ragnarok as well by the end of October. And, of course, Punisher at some point. Mm -hmm. Date to be released. That's right, yeah. Probably our biggest year for podcasting this year. We've pretty much got something going on most of the time. Not a huge amount of breaks on on our Marvel coverage this year, which is really good. It started off quite slow at the beginning of the year. But I think we're going to be picking up quite a lot of stuff as the year goes on. 
Yeah, and I think for all this podcasting delight, please come over and join us and subscribe on DefendersTVPodcast.com forward slash iTunes, or again, search Defenders TV Podcast on any good or evil podcast catcher. 100%. And as we said, we're going to have all these great podcasts coming up all in the lead up to Defenders. But if you want to make sure you know where they are, Make sure, as John says, you follow us over on our group on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Defenders TV podcast. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And of course, at the end of this uh, review and podcast, we will have our feedback. You can, as always, uh, provide feedback at feedback at Defenders TV podcast.com. And of course, we will draw from the marvelous strange hat the a winner of our prize draw for all that Funko Pop delight t-shirts uh, and and other little goodies from the Marvel Universe as well. Yeah, we got loads of great voicemails uh, throughout this season. If you want to join us for our Spider-Man coverage, it'd be a really good opportunity for you to watch ahead, watch the Spider-Man movies, send us in your feedback and your thoughts, and we'll use them on the episodes in future. Just as John said, email us to feedback at defenderstvpodcast.com or record your voicemail for for those Spider-Man podcasts over at DefendersTVPodcast.com. I think with that, we can move on to our spoiler-filled discussions. But first of all, Derek, uh, who wrote and directed this episode of Iron Fist? It's a really interesting one. We generally don't have more than one writer on an episode of Iron Fist so far. Uh, This time we got three. Uh, We got Scott Book. Uh, who's the showrunner for the show. He wrote the first uh, two episodes of the show. And we have Tamara Beaker Wilkinson, uh, who did The Blessing of Many Fractures, and Pat Charles, who did uh, Mistress of All Agonies. I don't really know how this works when you assign a writing credit to a writer. Um, I know they have writer's rooms for all of the Marvel series, so my feeling is the reason why they have three people assigned to this is because this kind of took shape over the course of the season because there's a lot of things that are tied up in this episode uh, that has kind of been assigned to three people who are tying up their own storylines maybe or the bigger parts of their storylines uh, but it is very interesting normally on these shows with a showrunner you would generally have them be the one that writes the final episode because it's their vision from beginning to end really and uh, we've had yeah. that in all of the all of the previous uh, defender shows i think and this episode is directed by steven sergic the most prolific director we pretty much have on board for any of the Defender series. He's done an episode of Daredevil season one. He did Shadows in the Glass. Uh, for season two of Daredevil, he did uh, Dot 380 and Seven Minutes in Heaven. For Jessica Jones, he did two episodes as well. He did AKA The Sandwich Saved Me and AKA You're a Winner. And for Luke Cage, he did Take It Personal. So Stephen Sergic is pretty much one of the one of the visionaries behind all of the Defenders, really. Um, I'm really hoping he gets a credit up in, uh, up in the Defender show as well. It, it would be it would be a real surprise if he doesn't get an episode of the Defenders, wouldn't it? Completely. I'm wondering. Uh, I'm wondering why they haven't announced that yet. They tend not to announce their directors ahead of time. We've seen a few kind of rumors about about directors for things like Punisher and for Runaways. We've seen some writers that have credits associated with them, but they're very close. Play this very close to their chest in Netflix. Uh, who's actually going to be a director on the show before the shows come out? I suppose that probably comes down to like the fact that we've seen what these other these directors are capable of across the the four series mm-hmm. we can or five sorry I should say we can now kind of assume oh well if one is doing episode five but he did previously an episode an action episode in Daredevil or Iron Fist well that's probably going to be an action filled episode maybe yeah yeah but John do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for the episode sure. In the aftermath of the DEA strike on Danny Rand, Harold returns to take control of Rand Enterprises with his children at his side. However, Ward has other plans as he allies with Danny and tells Joy about Harold's deception. Joy confronts Harold, who denies framing Danny, but unconvinced, Joy begins to see her father's true monstrous colours and walks out on him and Rand Enterprises. Meanwhile, Danny and Colleen seek answers from Gao, who reveals that Harold was the mastermind of the plane crash and the death of Danny's parents. With the help of Claire and Ward, they infiltrate Rand Enterprises to confront Harold and recover the data on the tablet that can clear Danny of the DEA charges. In the shootout, Harold escapes to the rooftop, where him and Danny face off. As Danny fights Harold, his difficult choice that will shape him as the Iron Fist, whether to seek vengeance or justice, is decided before Ward arrives and shoots his father, who falls from the skyscraper to his death. 
Just to be sure, Ward, accompanied by Danny, has the body cremated. After the bonfire, Danny convinces Colleen to head to Cunlun, where a bloody sight greets them at the entrance, and the mystical city has gone. Fade to black. Fade to black. Absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, really nice little ending here. Seeing Conlon uh, look like it had just had uh, a few sort of mowers fired at it by uh, Donald <laughs> Trump. With our spoiler-filled five points, I think it's straight into point one. Uh, Derek, what did you think of Madame Gao's uh, return for the final episode and her mind games? I know this is a really interesting when we kind of talked about what would happen to Madame Gao, what had happened to Madame Gao when uh, when Bakuto had been taken out. Um, would they just leave her in there? Would she break out? I really like the mind games that she's playing with Danny, where she's basically saying to him when he questions her why haven't you broken out there's just a bit of a bit of metal on the on the windows and she goes well i wanted to wait for you for you to come back because you know i was here um i'm waiting around to have this very conversation with you danny you know really really cool to see madame go kind of take that position of power back a little bit that she lost in one of the episodes earlier on the season when danny had uh, had taken her from "Quote unquote China." <laughs> it's it's kind of great to see Madame Gao start to play those mind games again and have no fear of Danny and no fear of Colleen when she's saying, "I'll come in there and take your head." Um, so so quite cool to see her play those mind games. Very cool. After all of these episodes, thirteen episodes, we knew originally coming into the show from the comic books that uh, Harold Meacham had killed Danny's parents but thought that the show had gone a different direction with it. We thought that Madame Gao had been the one, and she's the one that reveals here that actually the comic book story is has been slightly changed, um, that she was slightly involved in the death. But yeah, it does go back on Harold Meacham, so that was quite cool. Definitely. For me, uh, I think just having Madame Gao in this final episode was really important. I think mm-hmm. I'd mentioned that previously, so I was delighted to, to see her uh, back here in uh, Bakuto's empty compound, which mm. uh, is interesting as well. You know, where is um, his acolytes? But uh, I suppose that may be for another episode in the Defenders universe, potentially. Or do they all just get bled out? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe Bakuto <laughs> is feeding off them in the basement of the compound. <laughs> but um, I, I always love this character. I think, um, for me, she has been one of the strongest elements of, of this series, along with um, Harold Meacham, along with Ward as well. Just her challenge, her, her confidence has always really worked well against um, Danny's confusion, conflict, and indecision. Um, and even with Colleen, uh, you know, her her little sort of um, sting, you know, I've always told the truth. Can you be, um, can you be so certain as well, mm-hmm. Colleen? Um, you know, it just completely undermines Colleen's, you know, I'm going to chop your head off uh, comment. And I, I think that's a great dynamic uh, between those two characters. And then, you know, th- this, this notion uh, with with Danny, uh, there's still part of me that does think that there's more to Gao than simply a faction of the hand, because of her uh, knowledge of uh, the Iron Fist and previous Iron Fists, and obviously her reference previously to being in the mystical city of Conlon. There's something about her I still feel that is. Um, or could be teased out here, um, and I, I love how she she really you know exposes Danny to this idea of having a choice um, to take vengeance or to go through another door, but that she doesn't know how that would affect the Iron Fist. I mean, mm. she really lays on the line here that he has a decision to make to, about the type of Danny, uh, the type of Danny Fist, the type of Iron Fist that um, you know Danny really wants to become and that from her experience it has always been about protection and vengeance uh by guarding con lun uh to some extent you know almost a a a very single-minded single-focused uh warrior monk Mm. um of course uh you know Danny probably has has other ideas here, as we'll see later. But yeah, I I love this. I was really glad um, that we got um, Gao in this final episode. Mm -hmm. I was glad we saw her as as we did. Mm -hmm. I think that was the piece. Um, It made little to no sense for my logical part of the brain when she was just still sitting there. And you're like, she explained, oh, I was waiting for you to come back. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, 
well, were you? I just had this vision of her kind of sitting in the like the kitchen, sipping some tea, and then out through the window, she sees Danny and Colleen kind uh-huh. of walking across the courtyard, and she's like, Ooh, and she kind of like picks up her skirt, runs really fast back into <laughs> her room, and goes, oh, I was waiting here the whole time. Um, no, but so, but when the conversation got going, that thought left my mind, and I enjoyed the cat and mouse play almost mm-hmm. she the, i've talked about this actress before but the way she portrays madame gao is that she knows something you don't know and you will never know it uh-huh, absolutely. it's just that look and kind of the way that they the, the the kind of the tone she gives as she says her lines is very much condescending almost but almost yeah just condescending i think condescending is probably the best way i can put it Right. But in a good way, in that, yes, Madame Gao knows a lot more than Danny. She knows more about Iron Fists than Danny. Mm-hmm. Uh, she knows about Danny's parents' death, etc., etc., etc. I, I loved this. I loved the way she started playing with Danny's emotions. And we, I think we'll, we'll probably start to talk about it later. Yeah. But the way she, she broke him, she broke him with a few words. Yep. Yeah. And I think that was like it again just shows the power of this big bad that has been this connecting for the the evil Coulson of the Marvel Netflix universe. <laughs> She's been flowing across everything, and I think that's interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, it, I do like the fact that she's saying that Danny will never become the real Iron Fist that he has to be unless he kills Harold Meacham. Um, which is really interesting. It's kind of accomplish my purpose and then you can become the iron fist. You know, uh, this is what she's been trying to do uh, for, for the last, uh, for most of the season, really. Definitely. I, I think how she has used him for her own purposes to, to some extent, mm. which I'm not entirely sure are still a hundred percent clear because like her relationship now with the hand is slightly, um, sort of separate compared to say Bakuto Mm. or Nobu and so it's really an interesting thing and that's why I think there's still more to be sort of teased out from Gao uh, in in future episodes of of any of the Defenders room um, I think and I think that immediate ability to get into Danny's head I think leads us nicely on to uh, point two uh, and the return of Danny's flashbacks, conflicts um, his, his post-traumatic stress mm-hmm. almost here yeah. uh, Chris, what did you think on this one? Yeah, so I loved it at the beginning the way they used these flashes really kind of sold it to us as that he was he was a broken man when he still came back, even though he had this power. Yeah. As this, as the memory surfaced, I'm hoping this has a greater plan to it. Okay. For example, that in the Defenders, this is his weak spot. Like you start talking about his dead parents, you start talking about how betrayal, etc. That sets Danny off. That's mm-hmm. the Iron Fist's Achilles heel. Interesting. His his pinky, his his copper pinky, if you will. There was one point in this episode where he's standing, he was talking to Ward, Mm -hmm. and he starts having the flashes and snaps, and he literally kind of has that jerk back out, like, huh? I was like, I'll get on with it. I I get it. I get that he's he's breaking down. So overall, I liked, again, its usage, the the breaking of Danny. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's that kind of, in order to build something anew, you must break it down first. Right, yeah. You know, that kind of whole adage. I like this, that in order to reignite, rebuild, reform the Iron Fist to the Iron Fist that we know uh, throughout the universe, or the Marvel Universe, comics universe, I yeah. should say. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, this they is, had to break them. Yeah, this is kind of... Um, this is the entire point of the series, really, isn't it? We were getting, we got to episode thirteen now, and we're only now getting to the point of realization for Danny, really, that he isn't the Iron Fist yet. He's not there. He hasn't achieved it. I kind of feel that I'm, I'm so happy we have these scenes in here where Danny's doing doing the flashbacks again and and kind of fracturing again uh, at the thought of what happened to his parents. Um, this visual tag that's being used was used in episode one. Uh, to to great effect 
It kind of hasn't been used. We've mentioned it a few times. It kind of hasn't been used in many other episodes. I think episode two as yeah. well. Um, yeah. But yeah, it hasn't really been used much. And it kind of feels like Scott Buck, the showrunner, has used this opportunity of writing the final episode to kind of write that a little bit and, and go, this is fundamental to Danny's character. He's come back as a really damaged person with superpowers, effectively, isn't able to control them and is going out uh, going out against people that cause the death of his parents now, which is causing these problems for him. So it, it kind of feels like he's setting it right. This should have happened maybe once or twice for more in the episodes. Definitely. I think... Um, I actually think he had this as well in episode 12 i'm not too sure it had the the lines around Mm it i have to say i think the way they've done the flashbacks with the lines um in in this episode and i think it was with with 12 as well where he was conflicted uh it could even have been um episode 10 with the the betrayal of colleen or episode 11 but where the the flashback or or it, it's not so much a flashback but it, it's like it's going into his mind and it's much more serrated it's much more jumpy it it's much more um dynamic um and it gives that sense of confusion much better than i thought um the the earlier episodes were it was more just kind of showing the snow and and, and the plane crash yeah. they, this showed all these things coming together in jump cuts and, and all of that and i really think it gives a better sense of his uh, mental turmoil that than the previous ones did but then it is adding layers of turmoil onto his parents death you know yeah. i think in episode 11 it has colleen and his conflict with her betrayal i think it, it you know it has gow appearing in it has uh harold meacham because all these different layers of this this uh ptsd that he's got with his parents is now being maybe projected onto other things so i i definitely prefer how it gives a better sense of his and turmoil yeah than earlier on but i'm glad that they came back with with, with this definitely it also feels like it's really connected with his aggression this yeah, time as well it, definitely. it's like it, it's it's like his brain is fracturing and he can't keep control of that power that he has now um he, he can't get control of himself he can't center himself now and that's and that's kind of what it's flashing around a bit uh again i, I, I just wish it was used a little bit more in the series rather than just at the start and just at the end of the series. But I, I, I guess it's during the series, he's getting used to his new environment as well. And he's getting more and more confident. But at this stage, he feels a little bit out of control because he's on the run and he's, he's up against the big bad of the series, which we now know as Harold. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess that's kind of the reason why it's, why it disappeared, but I kind of would have liked a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think with that, anyone for golf, <laughs> Four. Absolutely, four head. In fact, I think uh, we 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 get yeah, um, Ward taken down with a driver, um, and not the one with a, a steering wheel mm-hmm. in it. I actually, um, I shouldn't laugh actually, but um, I thought this was really really good. I mean, I think you know within the context of Ward allying himself with Danny trying to warn Danny that, you know, the time's not right to kind of come into Rand Enterprises because all all of Harold's goons are there. But, um, you know, his dad, Harold here, I mean, for me, it just highlights Harold's delicious and delightful <laughs> uh, monstrosity, his evilness, um, all of that. He clips his son's head with a drive and knocks him out. You then see him dragging his body, or at least the remnants of the bloody streak, uh, to behind the desk with, uh-huh. with poor Ward's uh, legs just sticking up over the top of the, the desk. And then in, in the midst of that kind of final big battle where Harold is trying to get his revolver out of the safe, Ward is kind of like clinging onto the, the side of the, the wall for dear life. Uh, and Harold still has time to just turn to him and say, you know, if you do anything stupid, I'll hit you again, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, David Wenham just embodies this character's s- sort of obnoxiousness really, really well. And uh, it, it's no better in his relationship and, and the, the pitter-patter of the back and forth between him and, and Ward, mm-hmm. which he had such high hopes for and which have been dashed on the rocks from the tea. 
Absolutely. Uh, two great things about this. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier on in the series about any evil character who runs a business or a CEO they must be playing golf in their office. So once again, that is proven proven in this episode. Harold Meacham taking a swing of a golf club in his office and then taking that club to his son's head. And another thing I really like about this scene, something else I also mentioned earlier on in the series, it just goes to prove that people can hear your conversations if you're on the same floor with them and you're on the phone, right? Unlike most other TV shows, they don't ignore that. Ward just walks a couple of feet away and is on the phone to Danny, very clearly telling him his father's plan while his father's in the other room. And that's why he gets the smack of a golf club to the head. So uh, so none of this, uh, I move to the other side of the room so nobody can hear me. It's a pretty quiet office. Like, you know, nobody's there other than Harold. So so he has heard what's going on and takes the uh, takes the golf club out. So, uh, so well done writers on that one. Why do I get the feeling in that scene in Ace Ventura where Jim Carrey's <laughs> just like going, ah, closing the door and opening it. You were like, yes, yes. Right, right there. That was your favorite moment of cinema history. <laughs> I don't think there was anything about Ace Ventura that became my favorite moment in cinema uh, history. That is oh, a very no. good. Oh, really? no, Derek. I'll let you in on the secret. I hate Ace Ventura. John <laughs> absolutely adores it. Uh, I love oh, it. Oh, no. I think I'm, I'm they, Team John here. Yeah. I'm Team John. <laughs> anyway, back to Iron Fist. So for me, I loved Tom. Tom's performance throughout this show was amazing. I really have to say. Oh, yes. I complained, and I put, I'm, I'm <laughs> recalling my complaint about the redemption arc uh-huh. of Harold, Excellent. where I was like, no, they could, they shouldn't do this. That redemption made sense at the end of this series. Absolutely. And do you know yes. why I loved it? Because it wasn't really a redemption arc. Danny goes, why are you helping me out? And Ward goes, I'm not, I'm helping me out, which is yeah. has always been Ward. I loved it. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. I'm really enjoying uh, watching people watch the show at a different pace on Twitter. Things that you, things that you get from uh, Netflix series, everybody's watching at a different pace. I love people, you know, three or four episodes into the show going, oh, I don't like this Ward character. I don't like this Ward character. And I like the excitement in my head, probably the same as our listeners have had about us discussing Ward earlier on in the series. The excitement in my head going, oh, you just wait to see what this character <laughs> has ahead of you. Tom Pelfrey has been outstanding in this show. Absolutely. and But I think as well, not only... You know, he's doing it for himself. But I think that um, the resonance at the crematorium where he's speaking to Danny and you've got a fantastically awkward Hogarth going, I didn't realize this was a, a, a bro moment or, or at an emotional level, you know, like that. That was I, I really like that. Her oh, yes. absolute unease with anything touchy feely. Uh, it just came across so well, but I, I very back, yeah. yeah. But I think the the resonance of his character, it, I to me was encapsulated uh, within that scene where he is like saying, you know, who am I going to blame now for my failings, my addictions, anything else about myself that he's been so harsh on himself? He's mm-hmm. always put it on his father. His, you know, his father. Um, has gone, we think. I really like that resonance there of him kind of being absolutely brutally honest with himself because I think um, it's such a great part of his character. Definitely. Um, can, I, can I just stress, I don't think I've ever seen a more definitive ending to a character. And it's really <laughs> sad. I love Dave Wenham in the show, but uh, getting shot off a building couple of hundred story building and then getting uh, getting fried in uh, and cremated i don't think he's coming back well but they didn't remove the head yeah they, that is the crucial the point absolutely and in fact he was beaten up he was then run through on a spike mm-hmm. then he was shot then he <laughs> toppled over uh, the edge of a skyscraper to the pavement below if you can only imagine the mess that would make. Uh-huh. Um, then he was created. I still expected some fiery figure to show up in that little window of him, yeah. you know, coming back because his head hadn't been removed from the spine. We know this from <laughs> zombies. That's true. You know? That's true. Well, we we know this from Bakuto. That's true. So kind it's of like, like the fiery version of Titanic, where his hand would just appear against <laughs> the glass. Exactly. That's even that's what even I was expecting. Just <laughs> or just a twitch. You saw that, like as we said about, like oh, we thought we thought we saw fire moving in the cave 
mm-hmm. in Kung Lung. I was like, I was just expecting to see a shadow move up and down, or you just hear, <laughs> and then everyone steps back. I really wanted that sort of replay of when he's on on the spike at the top of the the building, where just that grin that David Wenham does for the character and him just to kind of like scream and, and say to, to Ward, come and give your father a big hug or something like that. You know, just, I could imagine him doing something like that. Yeah, well, he does say it to Danny, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, I just, love that. He says, hey, Danny boy, come and give your Uncle Harold a hug as he's on the spike, which is great. I think you mentioned it actually last episode, Chris, when he was about to get the head chopped off by Bakuto and you were expecting him to take the sword on, stick it into himself and then... Uh, and then still be able to fight Bakuto. So it, it, we kind of got that a little bit in this scene where he's on the yeah. spike and he's saying to Danny, come on over and I'll spike you with this. You know, think yeah. it's <laughs> Absolutely, and I think it's a perfect time to move to our point four, that showdown at the top of Rand Enterprises. Yes. And at Rand Enterprises itself with Colleen and Danny, we see a really cool fight sequence in here. And I think probably the full power of the Iron Fist is in here. Um, I don't think we've seen anything as powerful as this when Danny uses his full power of the Iron Fist on the floor of Rand Enterprises knocking everybody up in the air, blowing the glass out of the windows. I don't think we've seen something that powerful before. That was awesome. Absolutely. I think this was one of the the great displays of the power of the Iron Fist um, and it was awesome to see all the windows blow out at the top of uh, Rand Enterprises. Cool. His kind of spin over the table and landing and just the the mayhem and destruction that he caused by punching uh, the 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 floor was and, really really good and i love the view from outside when claire sees the explosion. Definitely. what are you doing yeah. Danny? <laughs> um what what i thought was really um i chuckled a bit at was that this awesome power that he displays here it was then kind of in contrast to the fact that he uses it to punch through the glass as he swings into the top floor. Mm-hmm. It felt like the squeak of a mouse uh, followed by the roar of the lion. <laughs> um, you know, In so many other shows, you would just use your feet and come in. And I just found it interesting that they chose to ignite the iron fist for kind of a, a punch through. Okay, look, skyscraper glass is going to be tough and Very glass tough, is going to yeah. be really difficult to get through. So I get it, but... It just didn't. It just it felt strange. It was like you see people smashing the windows so often. Uh-huh. But yeah, it, it looked cool though. I loved seeing just the fire or the the flaming fist almost uh, coming towards the window as as the glass breaks open. A great moment as all of uh, all of the guards for Harold are standing waiting at each of the lifts, waiting for him to <laughs> arrive. You know, uh, and of course he comes in through the window. Very cool. I'm I'm just happy he didn't destroy any more doors. <laughs> like it is Iron Fist, the immortal enemy of doors around the world. I think he destroyed um, every door, window, and wall on the top yeah. floor, didn't he? <laughs> so it's, at least if he has a superhero gig that kind of it doesn't work out for him, Iron Fist, decorator to the stars, yeah. that could work. <laughs> It could be Wing and Rand's uh, Wrecking Ball Corporation. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. I know the, I know the perfect theme tune for that. Um, but yes, the, sh- the, sh- the showdown at Rand Enterprise really, really, uh, really cool and big. I suppose big enough to justify that Harold Meacham is our big bad for the season. Do you think? Yes, I think so. And it, it's but it, it's it's a big bad because you know he, he makes the point to to Ward that he's been. Uh, affecting Danny's life for the last 15 years. You mm-hmm. know, it, it's it's the longevity of his plan, his, his use and abuse of the the young kid. You know, like we get that great explanation where he says, you know, him and Wendell had been at the top of this building on that ledge and he wanted to push Wendell off um, no for no reason. But he then turns it back to say it was the biggest regret of his life because then Danny would never have been born and it, I mean you know we hear from Gao Harold's involvement in, in um, bringing the hand into Rand Enterprises and um, organizing the crash possibly wanting to use poison uh, and now you know we've seen it in this series his his use of Danny and, and his double cross of Danny um, with the information from the tablet so you know, Harold is this big bad um, in the sense it's so personal. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I love Gao saying to Danny, stop th- thinking like a child. Uh, you know, who was most going to benefit from the mm-hmm. death of your parents? You know, 
Um, and in a strange way, I, it's almost like I feel that Gao is some kind of mentor to Danny Rand. Yeah. I mean, whether he chooses to take her uh, advice in terms of which door to go through, but she's kind of telling him what he should be thinking, you know, to snap out of his, his vengeful lust. Uh, it's clouding his chi, it's poisoning it. Yeah. Um, so... Like, in some ways, there's a strange uh, but beautiful relationship between these two. Um, unlike there was with Harold, of course, which was very poisonous. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing I wonder is, could we have gotten that moment with Gao back in Colleen's dojo uh, when she was tied up? Could she have shared this piece of information that Harold was the one that caused Danny's parents' death back then? And then have the kind of bigger build up to the final episode because we were we were questioning in episode twelve who's the big bad of the season who's will it be Harold is he just an underling? Um, this episode makes it plainly clear and it, and it's fantastic for that reason that uh, that you don't question it at all that he's the big bad. But would, do you think the reveal of of Harold being the killer of Danny's parents a bit earlier in the season could have helped it a bit? I think it could have done, and I think this ultimately links back with what we've said previously about moving some of these beats uh in this last four or five episodes mm -hmm. of a, a you know a strong ending as we've said moving some of those beats a bit earlier to say uh, an, an episode six or seven or eight just to allow it to be played out um but i mean it you know the sequence is what it is but mm -hmm. i think certainly yeah that that would have been an interesting thing to have seen this this battle with Harold play out uh, a bit longer, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same. I, I think, as we said now, the last four or five episodes, there's been so much packed in, so many beats. If they had have extended that, so that Bakuto was the bad guy in the first half, and then it was revealed that Harold was the, the bad guy in the second. Now, saying that, you would have had the, the, the deepening of the relationship of Colleen and Danny throughout the last kind of arc of the, the, the series mm. and it would make more sense this rather than this kind of instant love chemistry that they've got going on basically what I found is at the end of this towards the end of this episode what we got was the standard main Bond villain telling the world his super plan his evil plan for global domination yeah. in front of the hero uh, now okay this wasn't in front of the hero but it was like why why are you letting this slip now? Oh, you've to got to Ward. speak to that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, but it's just, I was almost, so I, I think if we had have got that earlier, mm -hmm. I would have enjoyed it more. That being said, I still enjoyed this. I really enjoyed, like, I'm putting it out now. Yeah. I really enjoyed this episode. I enjoyed what they did with it. Right. I would want them to extend it, though. Absolutely. I, I still absolutely love this episode. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, I, Actually, I don't mind in terms of how the sequence has played out. It would just be interesting to wonder how how it would have played out over maybe an extended kind of period over yeah. some of the back episodes. I think with Harold Meacham as well, yes, he does tell Ward about the, the plot, um, but he doesn't tell Joy. He's still... Um, trying to keep her uh, buffered against who he really is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now she's she's beginning to call bullshit on it, but, I mean, he's still mindful of who he releases it to. I suppose he just wasn't expecting that Ward um, necessarily would go off an ally with Danny uh, to tell him and, and sort of give him that information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think the you know that whole um, showdown at the top then was was really really good. I loved the dragon eyes as well coming uh, out and Danny sort of realizing that um, you know the battle is won. He he hasn't had to kill Harold. You know by that kind of immediate flashback into um, him defeating uh, Shao Lao the Undying. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool as well. Would Can you explain that to me? Because he kills Shao Lao the Undying, he but, takes his heart. But he, the the dragon, um, is not dead because he's an undying dragon. He's an undying dragon. Versus, so he's basically the, the thought process. Just go with me on this. Danny's thought process in this is like, oh, I don't need to kill Harold. 
because I killed an immortal dragon and that was enough killing for me? No, I don't think it was that. I would... It, it may have been. I don't know. My kind of alternative to that would be that he has has destroyed Sharlau, but he knows that Sharlau will come back. He also knows that uh, Harold will come back if he is destroyed, unless he takes the head off. But I think for him, um, it, it's not so much that he needs to kill Harold, but put him behind bars. So it, it, it's this idea of justice as opposed to vengeance. And I think in relation to the dragon, it's simply that the dragon comes back anyway. So he hasn't ultimately killed Shao Lao. Yeah. Um, Shao Lao returns. So even though he has, because it's an undying entity uh, as a dragon, he can say that he hasn't. And so he doesn't want to hear. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense to me. Because he's okay. more of a hippie than a warrior yeah. monk, basically. <laughs> you know, okay, his yeah, kind no, of peace and love and, and all that kind of stuff is starting to come out, yeah. A little, um, bit, a little and bit. And of which he tries to reignite that peace and love um, and balance uh, in the chi by returning to Kun Lun. And I think uh, with that, point five, Kun Lun, gone but not forgotten. <laughs> That's right. Question yeah. mark? <laughs> <laughs> I like this return. We got this right, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got, like, this is what we assumed what would happen. This was the development of characters, and we'll talk about another part in a second. Now, the question I have, is Kung Lung gone? Or was that crater hole where Kung Lung the city was, is that just a crater hole? So that's so I'm like, I was trying to go, uh, has it disappeared? Or Yeah. I know, is I, destroyed. I know what they you don't, mean. They don't make that dis differentiation. Yeah, I think I think I think it's gone. I think it's it's. Wait, we, see, we, we use question... your words. Wait, is it destroyed or is it disappeared? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's returned to the other okay. plane. Is okay. what I think's happened. We questioned a few times in, in earlier episodes. How long does Kunlung hang around? Because it disappears off our plane, I guess, for fifteen years. Comes back. But it doesn't come back for 15 or 20 years. It comes back for a period of time or is is visible on our plane for a period of time. Um, so that period of time has ended and Kunlun has gone. Whether they have the ability to push a magic button and make it disappear when they're under attack? Yes. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but it feels like there was an attack on Kunlun, obviously, from uh, from the dead bodies of the, of the hand uh, operatives that were there. But there were no monks left behind, so... Um, so I don't know whether they made that uh, made the decision to leave then and leave Davos and Danny behind, or whether uh, it was destined to go anyway and they were able to keep back uh, the attackers. Have they chosen a new Iron Fist to protect the city of Kunlun? Is that why Danny's been having some problems with accessing his powers? Something like that. I, I, it's interesting, and it's, I'm sure that's going to be picked up either in Season 2 of Iron Fist or in The Defenders. So. Yeah, because we do see that Davos hasn't returned either. That's so right. if Davos had headed back to, to Kun Lun, whatever had happened had happened already, and he wasn't able to go back into it, unless he's made a conscious choice not to go back to Kun Lun, which would seem strange given... The, his his ending, and um, he you know seemed to overall despise the world that Danny w was wanting to re remain in. So, True. but he can't leave the power of the Iron Fist with an outsider. So I think that's his kind of plan: is that he's looking to take out Danny so that the power of the Iron Fist returns to Kunlun in some sense or to him. Yeah, and I mean, then the the dead bodies at the sort of entrance gateway to where Kunlun would be were the hand. They weren't warrior monks. So did the warrior monks manage to repel them uh, away and then uh, hyperspace Kunlun back to its 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 <laughs> mystical plane? Uh -huh. um, or you know, were the hands successful um, and they have? taking it on um, a journey, you know, in the natural cycle of it moving from different planes. Will it show up in this big hole? Um, in, 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 you got the hole in there. Yeah, will, will it show up? I was thinking that because I remember Fisk saying how, you know, it was a sizable block that they were, you know, is this where the monastery is going to suddenly pop out the hole? Or was that the hole that they used to maybe get to Conlon or, or something or, or whatever? I don't know, but... I think it's gone, 
I think it's gone back onto another plane, uh, which I suspect if it has, we're not going to see it in Defenders. Uh, but if so, who's in charge? Is it Warrior Monks and the Thunderer still, or is it the Hand? Interesting. Uh, be interesting to, yeah. to see uh, definitely uh, what happens there. Derek thought those were dead mountaineers that just happened <laughs> to get caught in the crossfire. I did not. I did not. I got I got a little bit confused um, when Danny and Colleen arrive. I had assumed that Colleen uh, had found them and thought they were warrior monks. I thought they were members of Cunlan. Uh, maybe one or two of the warriors had fallen at the hands of the hand, um, if I can say that. Uh, but no, it, it turns out they were they were hand. I never thought they were mountaineers. It looks like way too difficult to climb. Absolutely. Unless, unless you're Colin and Danny. Unless you're a Sherpa. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. I love this ending. Mm-hmm. I will not lie. It left me enough questions that I kind of... I'm hoping they don't leave it till season two of uh, Iron Fist. I think it'd be he, weird, wouldn't it? I think Danny yeah. kind of has to know what's happened by the next time we see him. Because yes. they're there. They're right there. So um, yeah. he has to have some yeah. kind of answer there. But I think our guess in in episode 12 was similar, that they would go back and Cunlan would be gone. Um, I think we'd guess that the warrior monks maybe had all been slaughtered when Davos arrived back, and that's why he blames Danny. so we didn't get that. Uh, or we thought that Danny would see that, uh, that they were all dead, and, and that was the reason why he realises he's done something wrong here. But neither of those things happened. We just know that both of them know now that Danny was not there to protect Kunlun when an attack happened from the hand. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've just got a weird theory going on in my head here. I love those um, theories. You know in Shadowlands in the Marvel comic series, there is almost now I don't think it's Chinatown that they're residing in, but there is all the hand with the uh, oriental buildings around them. Yep. Uh, in slap bang in the middle of of New York. Could it be that, as I say, I know it sounds really stupid that Kun Lun is what is brought to New York in a sense, and we ha- it's almost like Shadowlands type of uh, storyline. This is not a weird theory. Shadowlands has brought up quite a lot actually uh, in comparison to the discussions with Daredevil and his interactions with the Hand and his interactions with the Chased uh, Sticks group. Uh, whether he may become a leader of the hand in the future. A lot of that seems to have been sort of set up in the Daredevil series. So interesting that potentially Kun Lun could add on to that. Yeah, and and so the the interaction of Kun Lun into the Defenders is that it's kind of been plonked in the middle of um, of the big hole. Mm-hmm. Or the bigger hole, it could still be bigger. And... That is ultimately how Danny is starting to realise what's happened to the city. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. I like the idea that Kunlung is gone. It's teleported, mm-hmm. but not in the control of the Wire Monks and the Thunder. Cool, it yeah. was yeah. taken out. Is it the Immortal Iron Fist series run where Hydra goes after Kunlung? Yes. Mm-hmm. I was saying, and John, you've mentioned this before. Imagine that's what happened. Now, think, the Hand have come in. They, they've lost one or two guys. Well, four guys, fine. But the rest of the army, whatever, mm-hmm. have managed to get through the Portal Stone and have th- taken control of Kunlung. That, I think, then becomes such a greater redemption, blah, 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 story. I talk about redemption a lot, I'm just noticing. But it's that our in Defenders, the Iron Fist must retake Kung Lung mm-hmm. and shows that he's not, He's yes, he's an enemy of the hand, and yes, he will look after Kung Lung, but in order to ensure that stuff like this doesn't happen again, he must be an Iron Fist to the world versus just to one city. Right, yeah. Be a a heavenly city. I like that idea. Absolutely. And if Gunlund's in New York, it'd be really easy. It'd be only around the corner from his upscale apartment. (laughs) That's quite cool. Um, Which we haven't seen in Yonks. That's true. That's true. But there is also an ending for some of the other characters that we see in the show as well. Here we see Joy and Davos having a conversation. So Joy has met up with... Danny's best friend from uh, from Kunlun, or should we say now, uh, former best friend from Kunlun. And um, yeah, he proposes to Joy that uh, that Danny needs to be taken out and killed. 
Yeah, this was this is great. This is the creation of Davos, mm -hmm. the Steel Serpent. I like this. I like this creation of bringing together the two worlds of Danny's to form a super evil Bliss Kill Danny group <laughs> with like the support. potential of an, an old lady behind her. Yeah, yeah, definitely under the watchful ear of Madame Gao. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. No, I, I love what they've done with Davos, but I just kind of didn't get this. I, I understand that there's a need to wrap up, but for me, I thought they had done it really well enough with Gao for this moment in time, with um, her speaking with Colleen and, and Danny. I think with Joy finishing up with Harold and, and just going off, I thought yeah. that was fine. And, and with Davos, you know, maybe there could have been some interaction at the entrance of Kunlun that he had gone back and was kind of in despair because it had gone. Danny meets him there at the top of the mountain with Colleen. Hmm. And, and to me, that would have made more sense then with Danny's fist firing up uh, at the end that, you know, he, he was having to protect Colleen then because Davos was going to go all, you're a traitor on him. Um, they could have done something like with like that with 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 Davos say or even just left it that you know he had walked away in, in episode 12 uh, after the the fight with Danny I would have been happy with that so I kind of just didn't understand how these three were were together really and um, for Joy suddenly listening to Davos saying you know he's nothing but trouble, uh, you need to kill him. Well, that's kind of exactly what her father was saying, and she wasn't having any of it. Um, and, you know, she confronted him on the basis of being shown by, by Ward that um, that Danny had been set up by, by at least Rand Enterprises, but, it, you know, by her father. So I think it would be good to see Joy go evil, but I was just kind of like... The, the kind of questions it raised with me was, how are the three of these there? How come Davos isn't trying to attack Gao, or can he just not see her? Why are they all suddenly in France? Um, yeah. it, it, it felt a bit too much trying to really shoehorn a wrap-up, but maybe it is going to feed into the Defenders. So I didn't have a great problem. I just wasn't entirely sure I got why right. they needed to to do that. Um, I, d I don't think it's a wrap-up, definitely. I think it's it, It's kind of just the final time you're seeing the characters before the Defenders. I'm sure, to be honest, we're going to see Davos back. We're definitely going to see Madame Gao back. I think you did actually need to see Madame Gao one more time after uh, after her conversation with Danny and Colleen, just, just to prove... What she says is true. She is able to get out of that that cage anytime she wanted to. She was waiting for Danny, right? Basically, I think you needed to see that. It did feel weird that she was sitting back to back to Joy. That that seemed like a really weird moment. Um, but I presume it, it's that now Davos is working for Gao, uh, effectively, or working with Gao. But, but similarly, but, we'll see in future. but I think that's a big leap because I do think that you know Davos's hatred for the Hand was absolute. You know, he was willing to take out Colleen almost and he mm -hmm. certainly wanted to take on the role that he felt Danny should have done in um uh in killing Bakuto certainly I understand you know the fact that he thinks Danny is bad because he's he's neglected his position as a defender of Con Lon. all mm -hmm. that to me kind of makes sense and I love how that is building with Dallas. I absolutely love how they've sort of built this character to be a, a, a nemesis uh, against the Iron Fist. I, I suppose I'm still not entirely sure whether he's working for the Hand. But that's also assuming, I suppose, that Gao is the Hand. I'm sure. still really a bit unsure on that so there, there are good questions definitely yeah. um it just it just felt weird seeing all three of them together um kind of having that conversation there and then but yeah it must be leading to yeah. maybe joy will take on ward's bad guy kind of role maybe they're messing around with that comic book uh thread uh to make joy the the you know go from kind of the one that her father and, and Ward have always tried to protect and look after. We got a sign of her own inner strength uh, when she confronted Ward um, about taking the, the offer given to them. So maybe, you know, it's that the, the transformation from this chrysalis will, will be into uh, an evil hardcore um, butterfly <laughs> with, with uh, you know, cannons on it. 
with cannons. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> cannons on it. <laughs> well, one of the rotating guns, what are they called? The mini guns? Yeah, the mini guns. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> That's the top five points of the episode. I think it's time to for a couple of notes about the episode. Just one quick one since we were talking about Joy. I thought it was really weird that her picture didn't go up on the wall of Round Enterprises. Wards did, Danny did, and he's gone off to Cunlun. Um Danny's father has had his picture on the wall for 15 years, and he hasn't worked a day of that, um, for obvious reasons. Uh, <laughs> but Joy's just, just taken a, a trip over to France, possibly on holiday, and she doesn't even get her, wall, her picture on the wall of Round Enterprises after being the CEO for years. That's really harsh. Yeah. It was a bit harsh. It's very much because I think she's left the company. Right. Okay. I thought that too. The discussion between Ward and Danny in the, crema- the crematorium, mm-hmm. basically going, come work with me, work, we'll work as a team like our fathers. There was no, like our fathers and, well, my dad's sister. I think she's out of the picture now. I think right. it's going to be a two-pronged, the, the, the like their fathers were and I think now it be, was set that Joy will become the evil CEO of hand enterprises <laughs> if you will I like it uh, that would totally explain why she turns to the hand to get Danny killed if she's been kicked out of the company after all the work she's done yeah oh, absolutely yeah. Um, I, just one point on this actually as well which I really really enjoyed so it was a great bit of direction I love when uh, Ward turns around his father's old picture that's been taken down off the wall and kind of Ward's face just melts into the blackness of the background on that image so you like you have uh, Harold and then Ward's reflection in in the glasses kind of melted into the the darkness, and I I did wonder is is that a sign of uh, maybe Ward becoming evil? Interesting, you know, and um, that the blackness in Harold's uh, heart it is unfortunately genetic in some way, and you know has been transferred to to Ward uh, and it maybe even reflects back on him saying again you know who am I going to blame for my actions and you know now that you know he can't blame his father he is maybe as as monstrous as his dad so yeah. I thought that was quite cool yeah there's a huge big note Chris do you want to take this one oh, I'm so taking this one uh, do you remember how last episode we got kind of like where the hell is Stan where is Stan <laughs> the man where is Excelsior himself well yeah it was Whack bangs first third of this episode. Yeah, it's about seven minutes in, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah about that. Actually, one piece I was quite interested in. They've made it easier and easier for us as the series have gone along in this Marvel Netflix cinematic universe. To oh, there he is! Oh, there he is! Do you remember? Like he was a small poster in the beginning on Daredevil. He was a tiny poster in the back of a piece, like the police station I should say within seconds it was gone now it was like oh well this we'll just hold this for an extra two seconds this scene and end yeah so, hey did you see that did you see that did you, did you see what we did there i was like yay i loved it but why the hell hold it to like episode 13 i know this this was it was almost like a scene taking place directly underneath the poster of stan lee it was so, yeah it was so clear that it was there uh, i want to say a quick shout out to davis over on twitter to ronaldo and connor um stevens over in our facebook group who all were very concerned for you guys that you didn't know that there is definitely a, a Stan Lee cameo. Uh, Davis told us the first weekend of uh, of release of Iron Fist. I'm glad I hid that, those ones from you for this long. Uh, and Connor and, and Ronaldo uh, posted about it earlier on in the week because you guys were concerned you'd never get your cameo for Stan Lee. But, uh, but yes, glad it's here. Uh, so delighted that they've kept up the tradition of Stan Lee in, uh, in the Defenders five seasons uh, so far. And I'm really hoping that your theory, Chris, that we do see a a Stanley as a police officer in the Defenders coming up it does come true. That would be cool. I think they will. I think they they. Now that being said, maybe Stan, maybe there's no love lost or something like that, um, in the Marvel Netflix well, for whatever reason he's been doing it for every other Marvel property across film has he done an agents of shield cameo he certainly did yeah yeah he was yeah. Uh, he was on a train in germany uh with there two you go. gorgeous looking ladies with him as always mm-hmm. because he is the hugh hefner of the marvel cinematic hugh. universe that was pretty much what he was playing yeah yeah <laughs> um so there we go so i'm assuming if anything they've just held it off for now mm-hmm. but 
I hope I'm right because if they don't, if they just do another poster, I'll be quite sad. I'll be fine. It'll be just like, well, no, it's <laughs> sad is probably too. I'll be disappointed. You know how your mother's disappointed in you when you've done something <laughs> wrong? I'll be disappointed in them. That's how, that's probably it. Like, really? Did you have to do that? Come on. You okay. could have done better. I know it's getting more and more difficult as Stan Lee does get older, obviously, to get him to do these kind of cameos. It would be very cool if we got if we got that uh, for the Defenders, definitely. I know he's done a few for the films all back to back so that they have some available to them uh, in the future when he's not able to film uh, as much as he'd been doing in the past. But you never know. Maybe one of the ones that he filmed recently um, with James Gunn, I think, did five uh five credit stings with him in the last couple of months um so it'd be kind of interesting if if they use one of those for defenders maybe they're trying to push them all together so they don't he doesn't have to travel very much basically i have one more that i just kind of and i i I know john has a, a big one that he wants to chat about um i can't remember but i remember i can't remember for sure but was there not a point where simone missick was supposed to pop up as missy knight in the series i think that because of the casting announcements that were coming out for all of the shows that were happening in 2017 from the Punisher, from defenders and from iron fist, I think we got, a, we might've gotten a bit confused on that. Um, Simone Missick is a hundred percent confirmed that she's in the defenders. Um, they have released the official photographs of her in the defenders. And I think we may have at the time confused that, uh, particularly because of how important Missy Knight's character is in the comic books to Danny Rand. Uh, we may have just thought or hoped that we'd see her in the show. But yeah, I'm not, I don't remember being confirmed for definite. I don't remember anything in advance. But I think there was just a little bit of crossover with the Defenders. That possibly where it came from. I hope so. I would hate to see that Simone Missick filmed the scene and for whatever reason it got cut. I don't think they do that, but I'd hate if that was the case. I'd be like, oh, again, I'm disappointed in you. I think the only place <laughs> that it could have, if it, if it was only going to be one scene, I think the only place it could have happened would it be potentially when Ward was arrested. That there was the scene that she was the arresting yeah. officer, maybe, but something like that. But yeah, yeah, and I think uh, with that we have obviously got Danny gets pizza instead of uh, <laughs> full dining experience. Absolutely, uh, much better takeout uh, than previously. Yeah, like, he also gets a bit of a haircut as well on the way to Kunlun. Very the, nice. the curly doggy lo- locks are all snipped. That's true. Get That's looking true. a bit more sort of like sleek. He's a CEO now. He needs it. Absolutely, he's got to stop that shagginess. Definitely. <laughs> Scrappy do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a couple of quick notes from me, just lines that I loved in this episode. Um, Harold Meacham speaking to Jerry Hogarth, the reunion uh, after. 15 years of not seeing each other or 13 years of not seeing each other and his response to her is I see you've aged reasonably well <laughs> to Jerry uh, which I thought was hilariously well delivered from uh, from uh, from David Wedham thought that was really good Claire's little mention of Luke Cage in this episode the trust me our criminal justice system sucks um, hmm. nice little reference from a character that's been completely done over by the criminal justice system in the US uh, with Claire and a great Jerry Hogarth line which was Danny, let's make a list of the things you're never allowed to say out loud again, starting with that. Harold was dead and, and has come back. He's not allowed to say that out loud anymore. I <laughs> love that little moment with Jerry. It's just, it's something that we talked about when we knew that Jerry Hogarth was going to be in the show. There is a lot of interaction between herself and Danny uh, Rand in the comic books. There's a lot of, well, the, the Jerry Hogarth of the comic books. Uh, and I'm glad to see there's a little bit of pitter-patter starting to build up between those two characters, hoping to see much more of that in the future. Definitely. And of course, for this episode, um, The Dragon Plays With Fire, that was all around the discussions between Danny and Gao in yeah. um, the compound, Bakuto's compound, which was really, you know, the boy touched with fire, which is um, straight out of the comic books as well. Really, really cool. Yeah. Um, so a, a nice little touch there to the episode title. Absolutely. And so easy in this episode to pick that one out as well. Absolutely. <laughs> we found a lot yeah. of difficulty De- without the season. Definitely. It wasn't a martial arts move. I think I think they lied when we kind of guessed that or someone said that before. I'm like, nope, there is no dragon plays with fire martial arts move. And if there is, I apologize. But where? Show me. <laughs> Do it for me on YouTube and then send it in. Absolutely. I think with that, it's onto the defense or not of this episode of Iron Fist. So Chris kicking off do you defend this episode of i'm fist i 100 um defend this episode for me 
Oh, well, hundred percent. Okay, let me say, I ninety percent defend <laughs> this episode. Um, the only piece, the own, uh, get the negative out of the way first. The only negative I had was the slight overuse of the um, PTSD kind of piece, the the flashes and Danny fracturing, but it was good for what it was. It was mm-hmm. just slightly overused at one point. And that I would have preferred to see the story beats, the story, uh, the exposition happen over a longer period. That is it. Mm-hmm. I would have preferred to see Harold as being the big bad and Ward's redemption and Danny's kind of, I would have preferred to see that arc that happened in 50 minutes over the course of three or four hours. I think that's my piece. Mm-hmm. But on the plus side, we see perhaps the greatest use of the Iron Fist to date. Mm-hmm. We saw a fantastic, we saw the culmination of everything that we wanted. Is there open questions? Yes, there is open questions, but that's okay because hopefully they'll answer them in the Defenders. Maybe. Because I don't know if Iron Fist will get a season two, but if they don't, I will. I think it's a mistake to not do it. Yeah. And thanks thing. As a whole, I defend this episode. I think they made some overall story beat missteps. I think it's a strong entry for the character. Well, with that sacrilegious uh, tale of no season two of Iron Fist, um, <laughs> Derek. Do you defend this episode of Iron Fist? I highly defend this episode. You can totally tell that Stephen Sergic has been involved in every one of these seasons. He puts his own little stamp on the direction of the show that makes it feel a bit more epic, probably because they did actually go and visit Kunlun in real time as well in this episode. I know it was only the end of it, but probably because of that, it makes it feel like a much more epic episode it was the big face-off between the big bad and our hero. Uh, we did have a great scene with Madame Gao. We have a fantastic fight scene um, in Rand Enterprises as well. Loads of great things that needed to happen in the show all happened in this episode. Um, you can't not defend that, really, especially when we've seen so many other great episodes of this show. This is up very high for me, and the 13th episode of the show isn't always that way. This is probably up in the top four or five episodes of the season. Yep, agree. Absolutely. So, John, do you defend Season 1, Episode 13 of Iron Fist, Dragon Plays With Fire? I do defend this episode of Iron Fist. I would give this four bloody streaks across the marble floor out of five. (laughs) Um, This uh, really, really was uh, delightful for uh, Harold uh, and his evilness, uh, his relationship with Joy, his relationship with Ward. I absolutely loved this. I love that we got Gao and, and her mind games still being played at Danny, but I still really think there's some information on Gao that we're still not being told. Um, oh, yeah. I'm hoping I'm right about that, definitely. Um, so a nice little bit of intrigue that continues with Gao, one of my favourite characters of this series. Um, absolutely love the, the fist to the floor and the power of the Iron Fist being unleashed uh, at the top of Rand Enterprises. Um, I think that end battle as well was really good. The choice that he is being forced to make. And luckily, uh, you know, Ward taking that tough decision. He has already made the choice, I know, but, you know, just without a shadow of a doubt that Ward decides to fire a few slugs into his old pops again. um, again, And, uh, uh, you know, splatter him across whatever, Main Street in New York, downtown New York, um, and then burn him after he's been run through and beaten up. And <laughs> I love the fact that just Harold loves taking the punches. Um, the <laughs> golf and Ward likes taking the golf clubs uh, to the back of the head. Really, really enjoyed this. Like father, like son. Absolutely. I think I really enjoyed the the end intrigue with what's happened to Conlon. Where is it? Has it been destroyed? Who's in charge? Um, slight little negative for me it was just the whole um, uh, sort of meeting of Joy, Davos and Gao. I think that could have potentially had a bit more explanation maybe or, or pulled out as to why they were there. But a really good uh, wrap up to um, the series of Iron Fist. Yeah, so I do defend this episode of Iron Fist. Excellent. 
so thank you guys for that defense of episode 13 and and the comments we are now moving on to our feedback and we've got three uh, voicemails that have come in and of course they are going into the magical mystery hat that is the doctor strange cap uh, for the prize draw right after these voicemails our first voicemail comes from christy altman from uh, the u.s hi guys this is christy from the united states congratulations on 100 episodes love listening to you guys i started Back with Defender season one, I love watching um, watching TV, different types of genre and series, and I'm always looking for good podcasts to delve into the show a little deeper. And when I stumbled upon you guys after Defender season one uh, was starting and loved it. You guys do a great job, and so I just been following along through all the different Defender seasons, and am excited um, to finish up this first round with you guys. And looking forward to Defenders and how you guys will walk us through that, hold our hands and make us uh, make us love the series even more. So congratulations, and I hope to hear more from you. Bye. Thanks so much, Christy. That's really good. All right, the way back from Daredevil Season 1 all the way through the Defenders series. I love when we hear from somebody that we've never heard from before who was listening to us back in those early episodes. So you've listened through all 100 episodes so far that's quite cool yeah that's very cool thank you christy for that uh really kind feedback and voicemail uh it's really appreciated thank you so much yeah cheers christy i, I just I, I suppose i should be the one to apologize <laughs> for having you having to listen to all 100 episodes of us Aww. i suppose like hopefully we've gotten better with age we're like a fine wine yeah as we defend the defenders we are now a crisp $300 bottle of wine and beyond. <laughs> I think we're still a, still a, nice. a tenner from Tesco's kind of what. Oh, uh, no. Come on. No, we're at least, we're at least, a t- we're top shelf, okay? We're, we're a, top shelf. We're a fizzy we're ne- bottle of Prosecco. Okay. Uh, okay. We're not right. champagne. We're Prosecco. I'll take that. I'll take that. Thanks very much for that, Christy. Uh, next up is Connor Stevens from Australia. Hey there, Defenders TV Podcast. One of your group members, Connor Stevens here, wishing you a very belated, happy 100th episode. Love the podcast and everything you guys do, and here's to another fantastic 100 episodes. But also come with this voicemail to ask, with the inevitable Iron Fist Season 2, what directors from the current season would you love to see make a return? For me, Peter Hall's incredibly brutal and upfront directing in Episode 10 and Andy Goddard's dynamic and atmospheric filming in episode 12 are two of the distinct visual styles that I'd love to see worked into season two's flavor. Cheers, guys. See, Chris, inevitable season two of Iron Fist. Oh. Yeah, Chris, you doubt <laughs> we'll, we'll agree to... Di- I, I, I'm, a, I'm a company man. I'm very much... They, they may look at the writing on the wall from a financial perspective, but that being said... We've yet to see any watch time figures released. This could be a very much slow burner. Well, Netflix never released those figures at the end of the day. So, uh, but I, I think I think enough people will have watched this show that they would uh, that they would be interested in continuing the character. I honestly feel that we're going to get the team up of Luke Cage and Iron Fist as the next next season of the show. I think that's that's more likely. But thanks so much for the for the feedback. Connor, really good to hear from you. I know that you're over in our Facebook group as well. Really good to to get you on the on the call to us and get and get a message from you, uh, guys. What's your thoughts on directors you'd like to see return for a season two of Iron Fist? Ooh, yeah. Thank you, Connor, for that um, for that voicemail and for the the question as well. Really good one. I'm definitely with with you on episode ten and episode twelve. I think. Um, I really, really enjoyed uh, Andy Goddard's fighting and the atmosphere and the tension that that came with oh, that. Yeah. And I, I did think, as you say, just the, the the character arcs and story that Peter Hall brought in episode ten just really helped build towards um, a strong, strong finish. I've got another two as well. Um, in fact, sorry, I've got another three. I, I never just give one, do I? I never no. give just one answer. But um, in, in the same way that Andy Goddard did um, 
uh, such a great job on episode 12, Bar the Big Boss. I absolutely loved Farron Blackburn's uh, episode 7 as well. I think, again, with that tension and atmosphere and how he showed the, the crumbling and deterioration of Ward in that episode. Oh, like, yeah. Leading to him uh, knifing his, his father in the stomach. I thought it was really, really good as well. And mm-hmm. another one from towards uh, the mid time was Rizza as well just with the the visual style there in episode six mm-hmm. um and of course let's not forget good old steven sergic uh, on this last episode as well uh, again really really strong i think building from the platforms that peter and andy had done in episodes 10 and 12 so if i've got a push come to shove i would absolutely go with andy goddard nice nice interesting <laughs> Derek, what are your directors? Um, I think you've taken most of them there, but I, I stand by <laughs> uh, my, my recommendation earlier on in the season that uh, Riza comes back and is showrunner for season two of Iron Fist. That he had a he had a particular vision of what he wanted to get across on screen. I think he accomplished that on a on a, a moderate budget. It seemed like uh, for his episode episode six, where we had the fights between uh, Danny and the um, the other immortal weapons, or one of the immortal weapons at least. Uh, I think he did a brilliant job. Stephen Sergic, I've mentioned in this episode, has been fantastic. Farm Black- Blackburn was brilliant, and as you mentioned, Andy Goddard. But I think the extra one I'd add to your list was uh, was Rizza. That I'd love to see him come back and do multiple episodes in season two. Chris, uh, there's not much more there for me. Um, my top two would be Stephen and Andy Goddard. They for me were the the visual style that I wanted for the show. Right, gritty, dirty, while also not too hard cuts and at the same time showing the emotion showing the 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 conflict on the the characters or if there is any for example Mm -hmm. not obviously with uh harold but yeah if i'm gonna put it down to one it's gonna be andy right i would love to see him come back and direct multiple um i think with our choices that is the the season that I want. Like bringing back Steve and Andy, Riza, Farron, Peter. I those five, I think could do some beautiful work okay. for a power a power man Iron Fist season two. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and I think as well. Just to add uh, to my Stephen Surgic choice as well, um, I think just that he's cross pollinated between the other um shows so well like i absolutely loved aka sandwich saved me uh, oh, from jessica jones so that was a really good uh episode and seven minutes in heaven uh, and the dot 380 were really really good from season two of daredevil and the shadows in the glass like that um is a great episode of season one of daredevil mm-hmm. where you know you you there's that dark reflection of fisk and uh matt murdoch uh, and Daredevil, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, as to how those two combine. So, you know, Stephen Sojic did a great job there. And also, taking the final episode is a difficult one to do. It, it really is, because you've got to close things out, potentially set things up, uh, and that is a tough job. So I would say Andy and Stephen, definitely. Excellent. Thanks so much for that feedback, Connor. Really good to get a, a nice question in. We've got another one in, one final voicemail for the series uh, from Ted Willard. I've actually held this one back a little bit because he was asking about some future plans uh, for the podcast. John, Chris, and Derek, thanks for your great work on the Defenders TV podcast. I love how each episode of your podcast is devoted to an individual episode of the Netflix series. It allows you to go into a lot of depth. One thing it doesn't do, however, is give you a good opportunity to do an overview of each season. Therefore, I suggest that in the run-up to the Defender series, you do a set of five podcasts, each an overview of a full season. Daredevil Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist. Doing so should ensure that both you and your listeners are ready for all the thrills that are sure to happen when our four Defenders meet up. Thanks again for your great work. Thanks for that, Ted. First of all, thank you for the feedback. We're, we're happy and we, we love the way that we've been managed to evolve our show over the last five, 102 episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there there is a lot there. In terms of your suggestion, I suppose it will come down to timing. It will come down to availability of our ourselves as well. We do have the Summer of Spidey. We have 
uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. We need a break. We need to go on holidays as well. <laughs> you get holidays? I, well, I, unfortunately, I do because, uh, yeah, I still have a full-time paying job. I am paying you way too much for this job. And that way too much is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're paying me a good fat zero. Uh-huh. Um, but I suppose we, we'll take it under advisement. We, we'll definitely, if anything... On the first episode of Dare Defenders, we will probably kind of do a culmination post. We have kind of talked about this before, so uh, so we might as well talk about it on the podcast. What we're actually thinking of doing with the characters is kind of a where are they, rather than a 101, which we've been doing before our, our episodes uh, proper, where we did a 101 for Luke Cage and a 101 for Iron Fist, kind of doing a where are they at the end of each of their seasons and where we expect them to go within the Defenders. I don't want to rehash the entire seasons of what we watched before, uh, going back on all 13 episodes, watching them all again and re-reviewing them, because I think we got quite in-depth on the episodes themselves. But the idea of kind of going back and looking at where Jessica started and ended her series, where Luke started and ended her series, and where Daredevil started and ended his series, along with Iron Fist in a couple of months' time, I think that might make a really good episode. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ted, uh, so much for your feedback. It's really good to hear uh, that you're you're listening in, tuning in. Um, and to be honest, your suggestion is really, really good. It's mm-hmm. certainly something that we have previously sort of talked about doing kind of an overview of, of the whole season. And as Chris has said, at certain times after doing the the defenders uh shows it's it's just not been feasible or we've gone straight into something else yeah. and but it's certainly something that um we've really wanted to do and i think it could work really well um just leading into the defenders so. uh, as uh, as derek has mentioned you know to give everyone almost like a refresher course and in many respects as well for ourselves yeah. certainly for me i would need to go back and just have a look at season one and two of daredevil even just to check those out um to to really get to to grips again with where we left some of these characters so thank you ted um so much for for all that feedback um absolutely thank you ted and i promise guys i won't restrict Ted quickly or slowly you watch those uh, as well if you do your rewatch uh, you can watch them as quickly or as slowly as you want so you can binge them all on a weekend if you want why thank you derek that's so generous that so kind and our final piece of feedback is the first piece of feedback we received for the entire season from Doug Green, a listener that's been with us right the way back from uh, the start of our Defenders TV podcast. Actually, I think right the way back to the start of our Gotham TV podcast, which started about a year before Defenders TV Yeah, podcast. absolutely. Uh, Hi, Doug. Yep. So Doug sent this into us uh, the first weekend after airing. He says, Hi, boys. Writing after I binged Iron Fist in the first weekend, I found the acting in the show to be a bit stiff and was disappointed with the season arc in general. There were plenty of positive moments throughout the series, but overall, I found it lacking. It did not get me excited for the Defenders the way I hoped it would. I hope that by the time you read this email, I'll have softened the stance after hearing your breakdowns. That's kind of happened for, for me several times throughout the other Marvel Netflix shows, so I'm hoping this will continue here. Doug did send another email in later on uh, after we'd started our coverage saying, The more I listen, the more I believe that Danny has some kind of either mental illness or his connection to Conlon is not fully plugged in. So the major events, the attack, the doors closing are affecting him in some weird way. The way this show has touched on mental illness, though, I'm kind of inclined to believe that this has to be at least part of it. So interesting that Doug did continue to listen and did go, did go back afterwards, and hopefully he has been enjoying our coverage of the show. Thanks so much for your feedback, Doug. Yeah, thank you, Doug, as always. Um, like, I, I think um, you have make some valid points. I mean, you know, there's certainly a bit like with Luke Cage, where I loved the, the, the first seven, eight episodes, and I kind of got a little lost on, on the final part. But here, I think, you know, it's finished really strongly. I think there was some really solid episodes around five, six, and seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, there were some elements here where I think it was, maybe I think you're right, a bit stiff. It wasn't clear about some of the of what was going on with the central character. Um, and I think the more I look at it, like going back to the Birch Psychiatric Hospital where Danny was, I think this this touch on mental illness through through um, shock and bereavement and loss absolutely is really interesting uh, to see. I'm really looking forward to a season two of Iron Fist. And I think with regards to the Defenders, hopefully it sets it up with Conlon's slap bang in the middle of New York. Uh, 
aka Shadowlands esque. Right. Um, that could be the name of the episode it, now that Jessica's involved in, yeah, in the Defenders. Be. Yeah, <laughs> and I think as well, a bit more dragon and a bit more mystical city would have helped this show uh, a lot. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Doug. Yeah, no, cheers, Doug. Um, I, th- I think, yeah, I think we've covered the fact that the, the mental illness kind of PTSD aspect uh, across this show, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in this episode here where we saw it. It was kind of pushed out a bit more and shown a bit more throughout this episode. Yeah. I, I, I hope that you do soften your stance. I, I suppose that's the, the thing, that the benefit of us each watching each episode then podcasting for example i think we'll, we see the positive in each of the episodes we we do step into each episode and look both at the the positive and negatives the, whether we defend it but then the visual styles and i suppose the element there that i hope that you can maybe go back and rewatch is binging is great uh, I binge a lot of other shows, obviously not these, but I binge a lot of other shows because of the way that... Exactly, I'm yeah, not. Derek. I'm sorry, Derek. I swear I'm not doing it. <laughs> I know. He shackles us in the basement <laughs> in between episodes. <laughs> but I, I, I do hope that you kind of go back and give us another try because when you do binge, you do miss certain beats because it all kind of blurs together mm-hmm. into a lot. Um, so I hope that you give it a second try. It's the same like I said to a lot of people who um who've watched all of these Netflix shows and some of them have like different ones and not others. I'm like, give it a try. Yeah. Give it a shot. Like it you may soften it. Also don't listen to public opinion. <laughs> no, I, I definitely I think if you're if you're someone that does binge over the weekend, I think you generally are able to make up your make up your mind through your watch. I'm glad that we're able to provide a bit a bit of enjoyment or a bit of added enjoyment for some of our listeners who have watched the episodes. I do think that these shows do work a little bit better if you if you don't watch all 13 episodes. But to be honest with you, I know that there are, there are some people out there that absolutely hated this show and are totally entitled to that opinion, obviously. Our opinion is obviously our opinion. We've really enjoyed discussing and watching these episodes as we've, as we've gone through. And I hope our listeners have enjoyed joining us for them. We have one final order of business. We do. We have the prize draw for all those who... Uh, sent in uh, voicemails to us. That's right, including those that came in to us today. Yeah, so thank you to everyone who sent in voicemails for uh, feedback. Uh, also for our 100th episode, you've all gone into into the hat. Um, so thank you so much for that. We've had really a good amount of uh, of voicemails uh, for this series, Absolutely. which has been excellent. It's great to, to share them with everyone on, on the podcast. And now that you know how easy it is, listen, when you're watching The Defenders, watch an episode, record a voicemail for us. Watch an episode, record a voicemail for us. It's really that simple. Just stick in your thoughts after every episode and we'll have loads more voicemails for Defenders. Yeah. So, yeah, we have Cooper standing by. Derek is shaking the hat furiously to mix up the names in the hat. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we'll now pick it out of the Doctor Strange cap. Mm. See uh, what we get. Yeah, who we wins all those prizes? Around. We've got a... Uh, a an Iron Fist pop, we've got a Defenders t-shirt, we've got loads of Wolverine prizes as well. Let's see who the winner is. It is truly a marvellous Marvel prize. It certainly is. It certainly is. And from the hat, with the name drawn, is Robert Phillips from the UK. Wow, congratulations, Robert. Congratulations, Robert. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with his green Yoda, his his withered Madame Gao Yoda. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. His voicemail. I do remember that. Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. And thank you so much to everybody who sent in feedback throughout the course of this season. Uh, don't forget... To send it in, keep sending it in to us. And don't forget to join us over in our Facebook group over at facebook.com slash groups slash Defenders TV Podcast. We're there all the time chatting with everybody about comic books, about movies, about TV shows, everything connected to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Marvel Universe. Absolutely. Thank you, as always, um, for for listening. And, of course, uh, you can subscribe to DefendersTVPodcast.com forward slash iTunes or go and search any other good podcast catcher over on Android. And don't forget, we'll be back for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 in just a couple of weeks. And then it's coming. Finally, forget about Doctor Strange. Not all roads are leading to Strange. All roads are leading to Spider-Man. 
Homecoming. Absolutely. Where, of course, we'll be starting our summer of Spidey. Guys, it's happening. I finally get... At some point, Derek will get a Nick Fury October, autumn, a Nick Fury winter. The Winter Soldier, the Nick Fury winter. How's that? I like like it. Chris, can I just say... Did you just say, finally, I get a Spider-Man movie? (laughs) Okay, I should say, finally, I get a Spider-Man movie in the MCU. Ah, right. It's all roads leading to the MCU. We were going to retitle this the Springer of Spider-Man because we were talking about this around Christmas time. We were going to start our Spring of Spider-Man because we already had a Summer of Strange. But unfortunately... Iron Fist just dropped. We had a slightly different schedule this time. So we obviously are doing this a little bit later. But yeah, I think we're going into our summer of Spidey now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, really looking forward to getting back to to look at the Tobey Maguire films because I really, really enjoyed those. Andrew Garfield films. They definitely had some good bits about them. I'm looking forward to going <laughs> back to them. Yeah, they had Andrew Garfield. He was really good. He was really good. Just I think the trailers kind of gave away everything that happened in the film. And the film didn't have a huge amount of additional story on top of the three minute trailer but hey we'll see how i feel when i when i go back and watch that again in the, as part of the summer of spider-man exactly so guys if you are watching guardians of the galaxy volume two or the andrew garfield amazing spider-mans or even the the toby mcguire's why not have a watch and then straight away jump over and give us your views on them and we'll make sure to sort of throw them into our summer of spidey and gardens of the galaxy volume two episodes so I think with that, we come to uh, the end of our Iron Fist coverage. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's been listening. Thank you to all of you who have sent in emails, uh, discussed on our Facebook group, on our page, over on Twitter, and of course, all the voicemails that have come in. Uh, we've had our 100th episode uh, during this series, which we absolutely enjoyed uh, recording which is of course all down to you the listeners and the community around the defenders mm-hmm. uh, a big congratulations to robert phillips for um being uh, the lucky person to have his name drawn out of the hat uh, commiserations to everyone else but we will always have uh, another little uh prize drawer events as always and hopefully uh, good luck to anyone who enters in the future uh, can't wait to be back for all of the goodies on the podcast and we hope that you're here with us to listen and to share any thoughts or comments thank you so so much thank you guys and while it is a sad time that we must go we'll be back pretty soon let's come on this this is an action-packed year it certainly so- is there, there won't be too long between episodes, but we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you, fellow Defenders. It was so good having you with us for the 13 episodes. Really, really good. I just didn't realize there was going to be so much emotional honesty within these episodes. Absolutely. I'm off to the golf course. <laughs> for... yeah, I'm, going to, I'm going to Kung Lung. Bye. Thank you so much for listening as always, Alan. We'll speak with you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.